Hello, everybody. We're going to be working on our Unit 7, Chapter 7 exercises this evening. And, you know, I have this, um, this unit combines really two topics. And I often get questions, why do you combine these two topics? They don't seem to make sense to go together. Um, and I just want to talk about that very quickly. The one thing that these two things share in, in, in terms of um, similarity um, in, in structure, strings and arrays. And we haven't really formally talked about arrays yet, but we, t we have used strings extensively right from the beginning. You know, we, we were doing our system out print lines and we put our double quotes around a series of characters and it's a string. You know, we've learned over time that that's, a, that's also a special type of class within, um, you know, the Java language and uh, strings actually are not a primitive data type. Characters are, single individual characters are a primitive data type, but a collection of them is not. And a collection of them is really an array or, or a, you know, a, a, a string of characters. And that's why they call it what it is. Um, you know, if you read the chapter really carefully, there's a lot of uh, things that we don't get a chance to cover because the string chapter goes pretty deep. Um, and what I would suggest that you look at you know, as auxiliary material to study is look at the section, particularly on string builder and string buffer classes, especially if you plan to be a professional Java programmer, because those are two pretty important technologies. We really kind of don't have enough time to cover them in our class sessions, but you should still read up on them. Um, and I think that what I've been seeing is that I'm going to end up splitting these two chapters next time around into their own separate units. Uh, and if I remember to do so. <laughs> Um, but I do combine them because strings and arrays do have some similarities about how we work with the things inside of uh, both of those structures, which is why I do combine them. Uh, in the old days, I also tried to get through both of these chapters in one session, which was crazy to do, honestly, uh, but I have done it, you know, during a regular four hour class session, though, not a two hour. Uh, so tonight we're going to focus on the chapter seven exercises and try to get through that. And if we can get through that, we'll call it a night. All right, so here's what I'm going to do uh, first is I'm going to um, get down to where the exercise uh, descriptions are here. And for chapter seven, there are three exercises to complete, and there's also an extra credit. And if we have enough time, you know, maybe we can get into the extra credit. We'll see. Uh, it's already uh, 10 minutes into the session, so we better get moving on, on coding here. So the exercises we have to complete are exercises two, three, and six. So let's begin by just looking at them in the book. And the first one, exercise two reads, write an application that prompts the user for three first names and concatenates them in every possible two name combination so that new parents can easily compare them to find the most pleasing baby name. Um, and then save it as baby name comparison.java. If you think about that, what they're really having you do is think about uh, the ordering, right? And there's the, the algorithm really is the ordering of uh, the baby names, uh, basically. And so the first thing I would like to do is begin by, let's just get the, the beginning parts of the application uh, built here. And I apologize, I just clicked on the wrong file here. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into Eclipse. I already have my Eclipse running. I will need to create a new project here uh, for this chapter. So I'm going to call this project chapter uh, seven. Then I'm going to go ahead and click finish. Inside chapter seven, I'm just going to expand out here and I'm going to right click and add a new class file. And this uh, I'm going to call baby name comparison. And I am going to click the little box here that says public static void main because we will need that. And then I'm going to go ahead and click finish. My package declaration is blank, by the way. All right, so here's the, the basic uh, structure for the program. I'm going to begin by just blowing away this comment here. We don't need that. And um, reading back on the description of the exercise, uh, we will be prompting the user for three first names. So you know what? We may as well get that 
part of the process uh, done here. So we know we're going to need uh, the scanner. So I'm just going to start typing that in here. I know it's going to call for a library, so I'm going to do the control space trick to add it. And then let's call our scanner uh, input. And we create a new scanner and system dot in and put our semicolon at the end. Uh, the other thing I'm thinking about is if we're going to have somebody enter three uh, names, we should probably have variables to hold those names. And so you could just do something like this. You could just say name one, string name two, etc. But you know what? Since we're going to ha have three of the same thing, I don't see any reason not to just put them all in one line like this. So I'm going to say string, name one, name two, name three. I'm not pre-declaring any values for them. We're going to let the user put that in. Uh, and then we're going to start prompting our user for those baby names. So I'm going to begin by just doing a very simple system dot out dot print line. And, and actually I'm going to do a system out print. Let's do a print. So the, the uh, cursor stays right there. All right. So then we're going to ask them enter, enter baby name. Uh, well, let's number them. Baby name one. And then we'll get our input. So inside of name one, we will pull from the input the next line. Right. And then we're going to repeat that process. So this is just an easy copy paste. Paste it twice. We'll adjust the variable name. And we may as well change this number here as well. Now we have three prompts. Uh, feeding into three string variables. Now, you know, the, the trickiest part of this, frankly, is going to be how the algorithm functions. And this actually takes a little bit of thinking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out one of my favorite tools, except I don't have it on this machine. I haven't installed Office on this machine. It's so darn new. So I'm going to go actually to... Uh, my Google Docs and create a, a new spreadsheet. And the reason I'm using the spreadsheet as a tool because it, it visually um, is easy to see and it's easy to move stuff around. And so if we come up with um, three baby names, somebody, somebody shout out three children names that you might consider naming a child. And, George. Okay. All right, George. <laughs> Gwen. Another? What was that? Gwen. Gwen. All right. Maybe we shouldn't mix genders. I'm <laughs> just saying. Bill. Uh, okay, Bill. All right. And? Aaron. Aaron? I, I think that's what you said. I'm not sure. All right. So what I'm going to do is now think about all the different ways I can arrange these names. All right, so here's here's how my brain operates, right? I can do this, right, by just switching those. That's one different way to do it. And then I could start with a different name. So I could start with Bill and then say Aaron and then say George. Oops. And then I could do Bill again and then say George and Aaron. And then Aaron's the only name that I haven't started with yet. And we know there's going to be two, two permutations of that. So George will be here and here, and then Bill will be here 
in here? Is that all the possibilities? Is it only six possibilities? Or is there something I'm missing? No, just six. Just six, right. And there's actually a mathematical formula for this. So if you have three distinct values, uh, and I don't know what the formula is called or, you know, where. Would that be a factorial? Is that a factorial that, that determines that? It, it might be. It might be that's where it, it came from. But when you have three different possible values, you can arrange them six different ways. And that's the reason I go to the spreadsheet to do that is because if, by doing it this way, now I have a roadmap for how to put it together, you see. So if I take all these and then like do a little bit of, you know, kind of planning basically in advance. And I think, especially when you work with complex data sets, this becomes a really good strategy because you can start to take these and you can number them. So I could I could look at George as one, Bill as two, and Aaron as three. And in fact, you know, since we're doing it that way, I may as well put everything in the center here. So it's easier to read. And so these are kind of bundled together numerically. And so if I if I follow, you know, the numbering for each name, and George is always one, I can just find all the Georges and put a one above them, right? And then I can find all the bills and put a two above them. And really what I'm trying to show you guys is the problem solving process here, that I'm not just jumping in to write the code, that I, I'm gonna have a cheat sheet I can look at and refer to in process. And if I did this right, all the remainder should all be threes, right? like so. So these are all the numerical permutations. Now, if I want, I could also uh, change these, right? And I want to read those instructions again, because I'm, I guess, when I'm looking at the, at the answer that I have here, it's not the same thing that I'm just coming up with here. Yeah, okay, so here's the answer. Every possible two name combination, not three name combination. So we were doing three names. So guess what? Our model is all wrong. <laughs> so, but we still have the same names that we can pull from. So this, I'd put a big X through it. Let, let's copy those names again. Let's come over here and try again. And I'll, I'll still use the numbering one, two, and three. And yeah, I should probably center those. Okay. All right, so what's every possible two name combination then? Well, I can go George and Bill, or I can go George and Aaron, or I can go Bill and George, or Bill and Aaron. So it still works out to be the same number of permutations? Is that possible? And, I, and I'm kind of I'm kind of posing the question. Isn't it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, I think it does come out to be the same number. Yeah, I think that's more coincidence than anything else, just because of the number that we chose. But you see, I, I use that that same kind of problem solving approach, and by like having a place to write it down, and then more importantly being able to take all of these numbers and apply them. And then all I have to do is match it up to my, my code, right? And then I have the problem is figured out, right? Bill is always two, George is always one. Aaron is always three. And so, Converting this to code, that would be name one, name two, name one, name three, name two, name one, name two, name three, name three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And that that should cover all the scenarios. So all this all this other stuff I can actually kind of get rid of. Um, but I like having this problem solving scenario declared for me because now it's really easy to write the code. Super, super easy to write the code. Um, 
And so what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to just do a little snip of this that I can just kind of pull up as, as I see fit and just look at it, you know, and I'll just move it over to the other screen for now. Uh, but I'll pull it back over when I need it and maybe I'll have it float over my code window. Right, so the next thing we really have to do really is just a series of system out print lines, folks, to get the stuff on the screen. There's nothing fancier about it than that. Um, and so what I would put here then is something like this. So I would say, well, do I even need the double quotes? Hmm. Well, we're going to say whatever name one is. And maybe we want a space in between the names. That's why I want the double quotes. And then I think we get name two. I think that's a pretty obvious one. So now once again, looking at this chart. So I just did George and Bill, right? Provided that's what we typed in. And then we're just going to take this output approach and just replicate. So we know there's six possible outputs. Now it's just a matter of adjusting these numbers. So we're going to go one and three two and one, two and three, three and two and three and one. So three and two and three and one. And that should cover all the scenarios. Um, the other thing that you know i noticed we have that yellow underline of course if you guys um, want to close that resource leak that it points out by the way you can just put in the, your input and just say close by the way and that's optional honestly the program will still work without it but it's just considered good practice to do it like this um so this should do it in my mind right so we have our scanner uh three string variables prompt a user three times, store it, and then output it. Now, for the sake of making sure that it's working correctly, I will uh, go ahead and uh, put in the same names that we used before. So it was George, Bill, and Aaron, I think is the order we did it in, right? George, Bill, and Aaron, yes. All right, so let's go ahead and save this. We'll do a Control S, and let's do a run. All right, enter baby name one. And I'm going to give myself a little space here just so we can see the output. Uh, so we're going to go George, Bill, and Aaron. Yeah, that's not a very good output, is it? <laughs> all right, we need to do a little fixing here. Those are, I copied a system out print. I, these should all be print lines. So let's just go ahead and fix those. Let's save that and run it again one more time so it looks better. George, Bill, and Aaron. So we could have a George, Bill, a George, Aaron, a Bill, George, Bill, Aaron, Aaron, Bill, and Aaron, George. I'm not sure those are the best names to do with this. I'm going to do this one more time. I just need to make sure I have everything you have. There's all the code if you're trying to copy. Yeah, like I literally did everything you did and it's saying there's something wrong. It's always like that with me, every time. Let's move on to the next exercise then. I'm gonna go back over here to my browser and let's look at the next uh, exercise description. So we're going to work on exercise number three, which has two parts. It says this one says create a program that contains a string that holds your favorite inspirational quote and display the total number of spaces contained in the string. Save the file as count spaces dot Java. All right, let's let's do that to start with the program built. So I'm going to right click on our source folder here again. We can't see your screen time. 
thank you for letting me know before I go too far. <laughs> and and you know what records in there is my Chewbacca background. <laughs> so somebody's going to be searching, right? Like Chewbacca, Java. This is what they're going to find. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and create the uh, the program here. And this one was uh, was it Count Spaces? Is that is that right? Count Spaces. All right, and we will add a public static void main, no package declaration, and we will click finish. I'm going to go ahead and just immediately eliminate this comment here that we don't need. And I'm going to zoom in just ever so slightly to make it easier for you guys to read. All right, so now comes um, probably the most challenging part, <laughs> which is to come up with the inspirational quote that you want um, to put in here. So I'm going to have to think about this for a little bit. Um, and so I'm going to create a string variable and I'm going to do what I did last time, which is I'm, I'm going to call it string with the name of a string. And then I'm going to come up with my inspirational quote, which I'm right now contemplating. Um, I'm trying to think of one that doesn't contain swear words, maybe. <laughs> so I'm going to pause the video for a second and think of an inspirational quote. Right. One of the students gave me uh, some inspiration here. Uh, although I am fixing the spelling. So no matter where you go, there you are. It, I'm not sure I find that necessarily inspirational, but it's a quote to work with and that works for me. Also, Ty, you put a your instead of a there you are. Oh, thank you. Okay, so there's our, our string that we're gonna work with. Uh, and if you wanted, you could add to this or whatever. The, the whole point is we want to count the number of spaces here. Now, if we're counting things, the first thing we should think about, or at least I think about, is the fact that we need some way to count them, right? And um, I'm going to set up a variable to do that. So I'm just going to, since we're counting, it'll be an integer. And I'm going to count the number of spaces. So it makes sense to call it num spaces. And let's preset it to zero. Just in case our counting fails, we don't want the program to crash with a null value. So let's preset it to zero. Uh, the next thing that we're going to think about is figuring out, you know, if you look at your chapter readings, because there are some hints in the chapter about this, how long your string is, is kind of a helpful thing in knowing how to traverse a string and then count the spaces within it. So in other words, by running a method on strings that can count the number of characters that are in the string, that will get us at least part of the way towards solving our problem. So I can't count the number of spaces until I know the length of the string, because if I don't know the length of the string, I don't know when to stop counting, basically, is, is, the, is the thinking here. So what we do is kind of a clever thing, is we're going to set up another integer variable here, and we're just going to call it something like string length and that's going to tell us the length of the string but how do we determine that well i could count so i could go one two three four you know etc but that's silly because software can do it for us and what if the quote was you know 20 lines long and so i'm going to take that string that we have defined and then just run one of the string methods on it called length and this is just going to return a value for us of how long that string is and then store that value here in this thing. Now, we could kind of pre-count, so we could say three, nine, um, 16, whatever. We could count all that and just make sure. And you know, normally I would say it's not a bad idea to do that, but there's easier ways than doing it manually. So if you have a really long quote, one thing that you can do is you can take that, drop it into Microsoft Word, and Word will tell you right at the bottom how many words and uh, all that are there, how many how long that string is. Um, but we're going to just rely on the fact that this method works correctly and trust it. All right. Now, because working with strings is really a matter of stepping through each one of the characters one by one, including the spaces, it is really convenient to use looping structures to step through a string. And you will discover in the next chapter, chapter eight, that it's also useful in stepping through arrays, in both you know, looking at the content, changing the content, or rearranging it. So in this case, I think it's really a smart idea to probably use a for loop to do this work. 
And I'm going to set up a little uh, variable for counting inside the loop, and I'm going to preset it to the value of zero. So I'm setting up a variable called i uh, to a value of zero. Now, how long are we going to run through this loop? Well, we are going to run through this loop from i, starting at position zero, basically, um, up through whatever the string length is. So whatever value we pulled back up here from the length function, we're going to use that number here to determine where we're stopping in the loop. Now, I know some of the clever ones here will probably say, couldn't I just take this whole thing and drop it in right here? And the answer to that is absolutely, you could do that like that too. So you don't necessarily have to start in a variable and then compare. You can do the comparison directly. So you could substitute this into this position if you wished. And a lot of programmers would do that. What would be the advantage of that is you save a memory position, so you're not storing the value. That would be one advantage. So now uh, I'm going to put a little increment there in my loop. So every time the loop runs through, it'll increment by one. Now, the thing that is really important to learn here is as we start to look at these types of data structures, because that's really what a string is, is a data structure, which is a collection of characters. Every time we look at one of the characters here, each one of these characters will have an index value related to its position in the string. Computers always start counting with the number zero. So the first position could be referred to basically as position zero. This would be position one. This would be position two, position three, and we just keep going. Noting that the length of the string is going to be one greater than the last index number because we start with zero here, but we count, humans count one, two, and it's one number off, by the way. But that's, that's important for what we're about to do here. And so the one thing that becomes kind of interesting now is we are going to traverse this string one character at a time and look at each individual character. So now here comes the primitive data type for character, where we are going to set up a variable for it. We'll call it ch. And every time we step through the loop, we are going to look at that string and we're going to look using this special function called character at i. This is kind of a bizarre one, but what it does is it looks at the current position we're in and then tries to, uh, not tries, but does extract uh, that character. And I see that I misspelled it there. So it's looking for the character at position whatever. And what we start with, remember, is zero. What's in position zero? An n. So the first time through the loop, this will read position zero and store an n in this variable. Now we can check to see, is that character a space? It's, and this is where it's brutally simple. We just check to see with an if statement, if the character is a space. Now, interestingly, the author did it with, with a single quote by the way, um, but you can do this with a double quote too, and I'll, you know, I'll do it that way. Um, but I want you to notice how that underlined. Why did it underline? And there's something in the book, if you did your readings, you would have read about this, that when you're working with characters, you really should be using the single quotes instead. Now you notice how that's not underlining. And that's just a preference of working with characters. So when, when you work with a string, you use double quotes. When you work with a character, you use single. So that is one of those reasons why we have both. All right, now every time it encounters a space, so the first time it'll go through, the counter's at zero, it'll read position zero, letter N. Is that character space? No. Next time through, it'll be a one, it goes to position one. That character is an O, lowercase o, is that a space? No. Then we get to position two, you know, so zero, one, two, third position. And now it is checking to see if it's a space and guess what it is. And if it is a space, what do we do? Well, we're just going to increment this variable. It's currently set at zero. And now we're just going to count up. So number of spaces. You can do, do this a number of different ways by the way. So what I would normally do and what the author did is I would just use the increment command. I would just do a plus plus and that'll just add one to it. 
Another way you could do it is you could just say num spaces equals num spaces plus one. That would work. Or you could go num spaces plus equals one, all of, which, all of which are functionally equivalent. Which one do I like the best? I like the plus plus. I think it's real clean, fast, simple, and self-explanatory. It increments by one. No reason not to do it. Okay, so that will keep running. That loop will keep running until we get to the end of the string. It'll count up all the spaces. It'll increment the number of spaces every time we hit a space. Um, and then all we have to do is give output uh, to our user. So our for loop ends here, but our main method ends, um, actually that's our if statement ending there. Our for loop ends here, so our main method ends uh, with this curly bracket. So now we're gonna do a system out print line. And we're just going to put a little message on the screen uh, saying the number of spaces is, and then we will concatenate to the end here that variable num spaces, display it, and end the statement with the semicolon. All right, and that's that's the whole program, folks. That's there's nothing more to it than that. Um, but really, what it's trying to show you is how to work with characters, how to work with strings index values, refreshing the whole loop thing, and of course the logic that goes with it. Let's do a control S to save. And let's go ahead and run this thing. Number of spaces is seven, is it correct? I count seven spaces, that is correct. Now, this is a, a kind of exercise that's popular in a lot of different programming languages, by the way. Um, and I know that if you learned how to do this in Python, the technique's a little bit different in Python, uh, because in, in Python, you don't have characters treated as a primitive data type that you can manipulate as easily as an integer. Um, and so the technique is a little bit different there, uh, and you have to come up with a different algorithm. But here in Java, it's pretty straightforward. You can actually look for the space and, and count it, you know, uh, much different than the Python approach. Both are, are completely valid though. If you want to really ramp this up a little bit, you could just take the, the string, uh, make it longer, larger, whatever. You could put it in a paragraph if you want and count the spaces and this will work. Uh, as long as all of it is one string, um, you can just keep adding to it. All right, there is a uh, part two to this exercise, which we're going to uh, talk about next. Let me just make sure I save my work here. And let's look at the exercise description. Write an application that counts the total number of spaces contained in a quote entered by the user. Okay, so now all we're really going to do is take that same code and basically ramp it up a little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build that right inside the same application. I would prefer that you guys create a separate application to do that. I'm just doing it for the sake of uh, speed and uh, convenience, let's say. <laughs> All right, so if we're gonna prompt the user, what changes do we need to make here? Well, the first thing that we would have to do is we do have to put the scanner in. Um, and what I would suggest is you can just drop that in right here at the top. So you can say scanner. Um, yes, it needs the library, so let's control space to add the library. And then uh, let's call this scanner, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. Input is kind of like one of our go-tos, so let's just stick with that. And this will be a new scanner system.in. And then let's go to the end of the line here. Put our semicolon. All right, that's the first step. Uh, the next thing that we have to do is prompt them, you know, so where am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to do that. Um, well, I've got to think about this now, right? So first of all, this variable is not going to be pre-populated, right? So what we're going to do is we're just going to eliminate this because the user is going to enter it for us. Um, the other thing that we got to think about is do we still start with zero spaces? Yeah, we're going to start with zero spaces, so that's okay. Um, and then will we be able to run the length of the string at this point? No, we can't, not until we prompt the user. 
So this might be a good spot to prompt the user. So why don't I begin with a system dot out dot print and let's just say enter an inspirational quote. And then I can just type in whatever they want as long as they want, uh, whatever it happens to be. And then we, of course, we need to capture that. So let's go ahead and we're going to feed that into which variable? Well, the string variable that we created above. And we're going to get that uh, from our input dot input dot next line. And now, yes, now we can check and see the string length and then still run the same algorithm. Nothing else here needs to change. Okay, so that, that's actually the whole completed program. Um, if you're saving it according to the book, this would be count spaces two. So you could just, you know, rename it at this point um, or create a whole new file or whatever. I'm just gonna run it as is if you don't mind. Uh, control S to save on this one. Let's go ahead and run it. All right, so now I'm going to type something in. I'm not sure what comes after this. What comes after this? <laughs> the clock strikes one. Uh, I'm not sure what it's the it's, mouse run down. Hickory dickory duck. <laughs> <laughs> mouse ran up the clock. Craig sex one. He had some fun. I'm making up my own now. And something blah blah happens to the mouse. <laughs> And I should be good, right? And is it correct? Well, I guess we would have to count it, but I, I'm assuming it's correct that the algorithm is correct. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three and 24, and that's what it told us, right? So it is working correctly, but that's how you test it, folks. Um, and I want you to notice I didn't have to put quotes around what I entered, right? That um, if I did, they would be treated as characters, by the way, uh, but the number of spaces is 24, so the algorithm is working correctly. So now, hypothetically, I could feed in any text into this algorithm, and it would be able to figure out the number of spaces in it, no matter how big the text was, by the way. Um, so that is um, count spaces two. All right, we're coming back from break and uh, we're gonna move on to the next exercise now. Um, and the next exercise is exercise number six. And if we look at exercise number six here, it says, uh, write an application that accepts three strings from the user and without regard to case, appropriately displays a message that indicates whether the strings were entered in alphabetical order. Okay, that's, and that, that's an interesting little problem. This one's going to be called alphabetize.java. So this is going to go, I think, pretty quick. Uh, there shouldn't be a whole lot of code for this. And in fact, you know, that prompting three times sounds pretty darn familiar to me. So let's begin by creating the program stub here. Let's create a new class file. And this one's going to be called alphabetize. Try to spell that correctly. And we will need a public static void main. Now, once I also can't see your screen, screen again, Ty. Oh, well, I knew that. I was just testing you, all of you. <laughs> so you guys all passed the test, at least those that spoke up. Thank you for reminding me. So I have the beginning of the program here. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to prompt the user. Let's get that piece out of the way right away. And so I'm just going to create the scanner, allow it to flag, control space to add the library. 
and uh, let's just call it input like we normally do here. And I should have probably been smart and just copied it from the other page, but hey, sometimes I'm not so smart. <laughs> then I just do the work instead. And let's get our semicolon in there. All right. Now, the fact that we need three different strings coming in uh, will be a pretty repetitive process. So here's an example of one. So here's a system out print. Enter a string. doesn't matter what it is. And then we're going to put that in a variable. Now you notice um, that this is recognizing the fact that I haven't created the variable yet. Um, so I'm going to actually let it create the variable. Isn't that kind of interesting to allow the application to do that? And in fact, I'm going to do that with all the other ones as well. And I, the reason I'm doing this, and I'm doing it, you know, yes, I'm copy pasting it in, and then it's flagging these variables I haven't created. Now I could have done something like this. You know, so I'm going to paste it in and show you because this is what I did last time, right? Just pre-create the three variables and then feed stuff into them. I'm not going to use that approach, though. And the, the reason I, I'm not is I, I want to show you, once again, the benefit of switching to a better IDE. If I have a variable name in mind and I just start typing code using it, and then the IDE says, well, hey, um, you never declared this, and it says create a local variable called that, you know what? Hey, if uh, all it takes is... Uh, a, a right click and it adds it for me. I'm all for it. It also makes sure that I'm not um, making a mistake. Now, how does it know that it should be a string? The way it knows how to be a string is by what's feeding it, because first of all, we we ask them to. But this next line thing reads in a string. That's what it, that's what it does. So it that's why it knew that whatever we're we're gonna feed into here, it has to be a string because we're sending it a string. All right, so those are the three prompts. Now comes the challenging part of figuring out how to make sure they're in alphabetical order. And the one thing that we're going to run into that you're going to figure out, and if you did your readings carefully, is that uppercase and lowercase letters have different uh, numeric values and therefore alphabetized differently. So a capital A is not equivalent to a lowercase a. So in that scenario, what we have to decide to do is to either convert everything to uppercase or everything to lowercase and then do the comparison and you can kind of do that all in one fell swoop so the, the approach i'm going to use here is the one fell swoop approach because i can actually write one if statement that will cover that will cover it believe it or not so here's how i'm going to structure that so i'm going to begin with the keyword if and my parentheses inside those parentheses i'm going to take the first string i'm going to convert that to lowercase. So I'm going to say to lowercase. It's the first one that comes up there. And then there's a second method called compare to, if you guys read about that. And what are we going to compare this to? Well, we're going to pick a string. Now notice how it found the other strings. Well, I started with one. Let's compare it to string number two. And then if we're doing a comparison here, we really need to also convert this one to lowercase as well. Right, so we're looking at apples and apples as opposed to apples and oranges. Now, if that comparison, um, we run that comparison, and that comparison will re will re return uh, a value. And what it returns is relative to whether it's true or not. So in other words, if I compare the first string to the second string, and it happens to be alphabetically first, if I entered it, you know, so so let's say I entered Apple and, you know, Aardvark. Aardvark would be first uh, alphabetically, but second in sequence. So that would resolve to a, a zero here. So it would not be true the first string would be greater than the second. And so what we do is it returns a true and a false, basically, is the point. And so we would compare the output of that whole statement to zero. And so if it's true, that means the first string came first alphabet alphabetically. So maybe it's apple, and then the second string is bread, starts with a B. So in that case, string one is before string two in the comparison. So it would return a one. So this would become true. Right? Isn't that how it goes? I will have to look up how it is. I forget like the, the exact format of it. But the second thing that we would check 
is to see if the second string is alphabetically before the third string, and that would be written like so. So I'm just going to copy this in because I have it already written, and it is a long statement, so I'm just going to go right to the next line to paste it in. And in this case, we're comparing the second string, all converted to lowercase, to the third string, all lowercase. And if I remember, and now I, I, I feel like I have to go back and read the documentation on, on this. And in fact, and here's the beauty of using Eclipse once again. The documentation's right here. And it says compares two strings lex lexicographically uh, based on the Unicode value of each character in the strings. And it says um, here. The character sequence represented by the string is compared lexicographically to the character sequence represented by the argument string. The result is a negative integer if the string object precedes. Uh, all right, so if the first one precedes the second, this will return a negative one, which would make it less than zero and true, right? Otherwise, it's going to return, I believe, a zero, making it not less than zero or false. And in order for this statement to be true, so the first string has to be before the second string, and the second string has to be before the third string in order to make the whole statement true. Now, if it is all true. Now, Ty? Yes. One quick modification. Um, if it's equal, if they're the same, then it's equal to zero. And if they're, if the second one precedes the first, then it will be positive. So I just threw in a less than or equals to zero. I see what you're saying. Because if they're the same, I'm not going to say, hey, you messed up your order. I see. And Steve, you might be overthinking it, but that would be the correct way to do it, absolutely. Because you're right. If the zero comes in, if they're the same, the one comes in, if they're the other order, right? And so we have to accommodate really for all of them. But if they're the same word, and I guess we could write an algorithm that would say, hey, that's the same word. So I'm going to, you know, if you don't mind, I'm just going to leave mine like this because I've already done the work. Um, but that's a ver very valid point, folks. And so I'm just going to paste in my output statement here, which says the strings are in alphabetical order. Right. And the only other scenario would be, uh, and you could do this as an else, of course, um, that they're not. And then you want a message that matches that. So, I mean, really, the, the, the logic here is pretty simple. The methods are doing a majority of the work, and that's kind of what happens with strings. Strings have lots and lots of methods attached to them. We just really kind of scratched the surface here, but the book goes into pretty deep detail about a, a bunch of them. So if there's something that you think of that you can do with text, you can probably do it with a method, make it lowercase, make it uppercase, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Sort it, rearrange it, the whole bit. I'm going to zoom out just a click here so you guys can see all the code at once. Let's go ahead and run this and test it and see how it works. So if I do apple, bread, and cat. Okay, so they, those are in alphabetical order. That would be nice to have a loop on this probably, right? And so what if we do cat, apple, and bread? Not in alphabetical order. Now let's try the scenario that Steve's talking about. Well, what if they do apple, apple, and cat? Okay. Well, technically they are in alphabetical order. So Steve, I, I see your, your point. And so you're right, if we would set these to less than or equal to, that should accommodate for that. All right, so let, let's try running it again with that scenario and see if it accomplishes the goal. All right. And is it in alphabetical order? It sure is. But what if I run it again and say, Apple, cat, apple. 
alphabetical. They're not in alphabetical order anymore. So that would work. The other test that you should really do is the upper lowercase thing. So for example, you could say apple, apple bread still converts it correctly. Um, and that's, you know, one of those things, you know, so what if, what if it's all caps? So it looks like it's handling all the scenarios, but I think that's a good, you know, Steve, that's a really good um, addition there because it covers that duplicated entry. The only other th weird thing that might be a, something that, you know, and we're not necessarily accommodating for this is what if a person, okay, they're, they're all clever and everything, and they might give you some characters, but then they put in a blank. Does the blank count? Apparently, it didn't crash your program, right? And could I just enter a blank three times? You can, according to what we have here. So that would work. All right, any questions on this one? You guys good? All right, so we're going to go ahead and run this code now, and I, I, I will tell you guys, I, I did pause the recording at some point, and I don't know where I paused it, but I'm now unpausing it. So this is the, the finished version of Alphabetize 2 with the scanner at the top, but here's the logic for it, and I, uh, I apologize to the people watching the video because I don't know how much of it I cut out because uh, I did pause it in a moment for a question, um, but here's the completed logic. Let's go ahead and run it. I'm going to move this up a little bit as much as I can and let's go ahead and run it and then we could, we, we'll put the code back up on the screen in just a moment. All right, so let's put in um, kind of the three words we've been using and I'm going to go backwards with them. See if it can handle that. Did just fine. Let's uh, let's go bread cat apple did just fine let's do it alphabetically apple bread cat and really the thing to do is to try every possible permutation that would be the, the logical thing to do and i think i've tried a, most of them but it, all of them seem to be working what we could do to try to mess it up of course is put in a couple of the same words. And what's interesting about this is this is a good example of a scenario where we really don't need those equal signs because it still figures it out. That, that's why I removed them, by the way. All right, so that's an example of the program running. Um, here is a majority of the code. There is a scanner import above in the class statement itself. Uh, but this is the completed application, folks. I'm going to take one zoom click out here. It allows me. There we go. There's the completed application. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about exercise number four in this chapter as well. Uh, this is an exercise that has been designated as extra credit. And let me just read through it real quick. It says, write an application that prompts the user for a password that contains at least two uppercase letters, at least three lowercase letters, and at least one digit. Continuously reprompt the user until a valid password is entered. Display a message indicating whether the password is valid. If not, display the reason the password is not valid. Now, I want you to think about this as, as an application because this is the kind of thing, you know, in modern computing, we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis every time we log into a system or set a password. Um, and, you know, we, we have this, you know, thought or realization perhaps that, oh man, that, that code, that's really hard to write, uh, nothing I'll ever be able to do or something like that. And what we're showing you is that it's actually not that difficult to do and it's actually a really important uh, type of algorithm to know how to do just in case you're ever put into the situation where you have to do exactly this professionally um, and so what we'll do is uh, build this 
um, and this one's going to be called uh, validate uh, password. All right, so there's a bunch of different things that we kind of have to accomplish uh, in order to make this happen. Um, and a lot of it just really involves uh, thinking, uh, thinking this through, frankly. And I have a couple of different solutions that I've looked at here, and I'm kind of bouncing between them on my one screen, trying to find, I think, what I'm hoping is maybe the most elegant one to share with you. Uh, because it seems like every semester I do this, I do it a little bit differently. Um, and you know what? That's quite all right. Um, in fact, you know, it's kind of neat that, you know, they're different sometimes because it just shows that you can accomplish it uh, a few different ways. And so I'm just trying to find one that I think is useful. The other reason I like to work on this one is when we work on our final project, there's an aspect of the project that has you password protect part of the application and so this actually becomes functionally useful uh, in that regard um, and i'm finding my code here so just bear with me folks i'm trying to find okay so i'm not i'm not finding versions of it that i really like so i'm just going to go with the with the author's version here uh, and i'm going to begin the build i don't promise that we'll be able to finish it before we're done here but i'll try Okay, so here we go. So let's begin by creating a new um, class file. Um, this one's going to be called validate password. And we will need a public static void main. Now I know straight away that we, we are going to be asking the user to enter stuff. So let's just get the scanner piece out of the way immediately. Um, and let's just call that, what are we going to call it this time? Um, input's probably fine. In fact, you know, I'm going to just abbreviate it just to create a little differentiation here. All right, so there's our scanner. And now i got to think about all the ramifications of this. So I'm going to reread this. Um, so to prompt a user for a password, it contains at least two uppercase, three lowercase, and at least one digit. Um, and okay, and then whether the password is valid, and if not, display the reason the password is not valid. Um, it doesn't tell us how many characters it should be though, which I think is kind of odd, or, or does it? And, and the truth is actually it does. Because if you have at least two uppercase, that's two, three lowercase, that's five, and at least one digit, that's how many characters? Well, it's six. Okay, so you got, it's gotta be at least six characters long. Uh, so that's a little piece of information that for us is kind of helpful. So what I'm thinking of right now are all the different pieces I'm gonna need for variables to keep track of things. So like right away, like in my head, I'm thinking like this. I'm thinking, all right, well, I'm going to keep count of the uppercase letters. So let's do an upper count. And you know what? Since we're keeping a count, we better set it to zero because we don't know if they'll intelligently enter it or not. So we don't want it to error out. And then, okay, well, we're going to do the same thing for lower. So we're going to do a lower count. And how many of them had to be a digit? At least one numeric digit. So we're going to do a uh, digit count. And if we know that we're going to need at least six characters, we probably want to count all the letters too. So I'm just going to do a letter count on top of it just to have a way to keep track. Okay, so that's three variables that we have created. Um, the other thing that you might opt to do, and this is maybe more a matter of preference than anything else because you can hard code the stuff in, is you might want to consider setting up constants that define the boundaries of these. So for example, I might say uh, the number of uppercase letters. So here I'm just pasting it in. Um, and that's two. And, and why would I do this as a constant? Because if the rules change, I would just come up to the top of my code change the number of these that are required to move on. I don't have to go 
clean up all the hard-coded numbers before and find them. This will help maintenance in the future. We'll do the same thing with lowercase. So we'll create a, a constant for the number of lowercase letters, preset for three, and the number of digits or numbers, basically, uh, preset to one. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of variables and constants to help us out. Now, the other thing I'm thinking about, too, is, you know, if we're doing a letter count, you know, we at some point will probably check to see if the string is long enough or how long the string is. Uh, so I'm just going to create a variable to do that as well. Um, I'll just put that right here. So let's do an integer for a string length, just to store the value. I'm not going to preset it. That's going to be kind of dy dynamically determined, uh, and the user's not interfacing with that, so no, no chance at errors. The other thing that probably would be helpful, too, is maybe to have a, a string to store the password or uh, to work with. And you know what? Let's just call it a string again. That's fine. Uh, we don't have to pre-populate it either. Uh, now I'm trying to think here, is there anything else we want to check for? Is there something that we would want to have people not include in, in a password? And the one thing that always sticks in my head is it's not usually a good idea um, to allow users to put spaces in their passwords um, because that's one of the number one reasons why passwords fail, believe it or not, because we have this tendency when we type, and I'm going to do it right now, you type, you hit space, you type, you hit space. So if I type my password and I hit space and then hit enter, well, that space is part of the password. I really want to discourage that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to set um, a counter to keep track of the number of spaces. And I'm going to recommend that if it exceeds, if any spaces get added, basically, I'm going to put out a message that says, hey, no, <laughs> don't do it. All right. So I'm going to preset this to zero and hopefully it stays at zero. All right, so that I think is all the variables I'm going to need at this point. All right, so I've got my scanner, my constants, upper, lower, digit count, letter count, string length, the string we're going to put in, and the number of spaces. Okay, all of that is together. Now let's go ahead and prompt our user. So I'm, just, I'm going to get a message on the screen, system.out.println, and let's say something like, uh, I don't know, well, this is for a password, right? So enter your password. That's a good prompt, I think. And let's get a semicolon at the end. Now we're going to capture the input from the keyboard. That's going to go uh, to our string, which we called a string. A string. And that's going to store the in next line, whatever they type. Hopefully it's right. Um, and yes, I noticed the mistake. All right. And then it's probably not a bad idea to check the length right away. So we, we have it. We'll, we'll know if it's long enough to be right off the bat. So we can just say string length, uh, the variable that we created, will now be equal to um, the string that we just got run through the length function and that will return a, a number that it will store in the variable for us. Now we know the string length. Now the string length is going to be helpful for a number of different reasons. Um, but first for the loop that we're about to run next. And the loop, the loop's job is to kind of keep track of us stepping through each character um, one at a time like we did before. So we're going to look at each character individually and determine where it's at and then keep a count. Is it uppercase? Is it lowercase? Is it, you know, whatever. And that will be handled by the loop in a series of if else statements. So let's start with the loop structure. I'm going to start with a for loop and I'm going to set an integer i as a counter starting at zero. Pretty typical. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to let that loop run from zero up to whatever that string length is. So let's call the string length that we already determined. And then every time we go through the loop, we're going to increment by one and move forward. Let's get our curly brackets in here. And now let's start to tear, tear the string apart 
We'll start by looking at the characters. We're going to set up a variable for character. We use the same thing we did last time. And you notice how this is exactly the same syntax we used before. So in that string, we're going to be looking at each character individually, the character at which position, at the current index position, whatever i resolves to be. Start at zero, then one, then two, then three, until we run out of string. Okay. So now that we've looked at the character and we have it loaded up and stored in a variable, now we can do our comparisons. And more importantly, we can start to run algorithms um, that will automatically contend with this. Um, and so in other words, we have methods that can check to see if uh, something is what it is, right? So now we're going to check and see, we're, we'll say something like if the character is, oh, and I'm noticing that this is flagging for me. I wonder, oh yeah, I didn't, that's not what I called it, right? <laughs> All right. If the character, and they have a method called is uppercase, and uh, anytime you see a method that's pre-created that starts with the word is, it's checking for true and false. And so we're just checking to see, is the character, oh wait, this isn't right either. I had it right before. And I apologize for that. Yeah, because we're pulling from the character class, the method is it uppercase, and then we're feeding into it the character. That's that's the right syntax, All right? And so if that's true, if there is, um, if the character is uppercase, well, then we can add to our count, right? So we can take our upper count and give it a plus plus. It just adds one to it, All right? If it's not uppercase, well, then it might be lowercase. So then we would say else if, you know what, let's just borrow the syntax here because it's not going to be much different. If the character is, yes, there's one called is lowercase, then we'll change the lower count. And then if it's not lowercase, then it might be, and I say might here, not will be, but else we would have to check it again. The character is this time, is it a digit? And there's a method for that too. So if it's a digit, then we will increase the digit count. All right. Now, some people will not write this, by the way, and I just, I'm just gonna put this out there. Some people will not write this as if, else if, else if. You could also write this, and I'm just putting it out there for food for thought here, as three if statements, right? You could do this, and it's the same, right? Because the character can't be uppercase and lowercase and a digit. So it's one of the three scenarios is going to hit only if it's applicable. I'm, I'm going to put it back to the way I had it, um, just because that's the way I've done it in the past. and and in my eye, it looks cleaner. That's me. All right. Now, that's covering the scenario. Is it uppercase? Is it lowercase? Or is it a digit? Now we have to check something else. And, and at this point, is the loop done? Well, yeah, because because we hope that all those things will basically trigger, right? You know, upper, lower, and, and a digit, and it'll count up, and it'll be fine. Um, but there's other scenarios to, to contemplate here, and how you approach this part of it is, is kind of the part that allows us to interface with the user. So this simply, this loop is simply going to count through what we have and do a count, and then we can output it and look and go, yeah, this many upper, this many lower, this many digits. Is that true? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Uh, wonderful, right? Um, but in this situation, we also want to check if, and so I'm writing a new if statement here, and this is outside that for loop. I want you to keep that in mind. If that upper count is greater than or equal to 
the number of, I'm trying to remember how I named it, upper letters. If the upper count is greater than the number of upper letters, like the predetermined amount, and the lower count is greater than or equal to the number of lower letters, and I'm hoping you guys see where I'm going with this, and, right, so I'm going to add to that and, the digit count is greater than or equal to the number of digits. Okay, so if, if all three of those situations are true, then we can just put out a very, very simple little message saying, yep, yeah, that's a valid password. You know, so we would just, I'll put that. Valid password, good job, whatever. Um, that pa password works. And if you were, if somebody typed it incorrectly and hit the submit button, it's a valid password, it just goes through. You might get a little message on the screen that says good, you know, a green box pops up or something. Um, now, next, um, what if it's not though? What if that doesn't register correctly? Well, then you're in the situation here, and here's where I'm going to put in a set of curly brackets because we are going to have more than one statement. Then we're going to put a message on the screen telling them what's wrong. Okay, so here we would we would just simply mention um, the password did not have enough of the following, and then we're going to indicate what it is. So taking these one at a time now. So what if the uppercase letters was less than the amount required? Then we'll just say um, did not, so the, it'll print out a thing, the password did not have enough of the following, uppercase letters. And what I would do, you know, from a user interface perspective, I would remind them uh, that uh, at least two are required, I would specify, right? And then if the same scenario, if there's not enough of the lowercase letters, you would do something like this. And with these, at least three are required. And then finally with the digits, And how many digits were required? I forget. One. I might, I think digits is kind of deceiving. I would say numbers, at least one is required. All right, so this, this algorithm would work to do what we're talking about. So really what we have to do now is test it and see if it's okay. Um, I'm noticing I didn't use this variable, even though I thought it was going to. So I didn't ultimately check it all the way through. I didn't count the number of letters either, so I'm not really sure why I put that in there. Um, is there anything else here I'm missing? No, I think I think we're okay. Let's let's try running it and see if what it what happens. I think that's really kind of a good scenario here. Now, let's uh, type in a password. Um, and here, how about I do this? All right. So it is recognizing it correctly. Let me run it again. And you know, what What I would argue here, um, and, and I'm just going to go ahead and just kind of do this and then we'll talk about it. Okay, two uppercase, three lowercase, and one number. I would argue that for the sake of helping your user, that you might want to consider doing a system help print line 
that tells them what the requirements are in advance. I mean, this is just me thinking, right? Don't you hate that if you go to a place and they don't tell you what the requirements are until after you put it in wrong? It's very frustrating. Um, you might want to say passwords require two uppercase, three lowercase, and one number. And that way, at least they have some sort of a roadmap on, on how to make this happen. Now, I think that's just kind of user common courtesy. Now, I want you to notice one part that we haven't thrown in here yet is continuously reprompt the user until a valid password is entered. Hmm. Okay, so this is kind of like a whole different uh, level of this. And then display a message indicating whether the password is valid. If not, display the, the reason. All right, that part we got. But what about this continuously reprompting part? How would we accomplish that? Well, here's, here's, the, here's the crux of this. I gave you all the password logic. If you want to figure out the loop that keeps prompting the user over and over, that's going to be on you. That's where you're going to get that other extra credit point from. So if you get this part of it, I'll give you one extra credit point. If you get the loop to work that keeps prompting the user, then you'll get the second extra credit point. So I'm not going to give you the complete answer on this, but if you think about some of the code that we wrote just last week, and you know, I'm going to jump back to chapter six here. I don't remember which exact exercise it was that had us reprompting. Does anybody remember which one it was? Um, yeah, I think it was this one, right? And so it's this logic here that you could apply. So one, just a hint, right? Uh, how long would you run that loop until the password is valid? So you might create something that's like password valid, true, false, and then set it somewhere if it is, and then if it's valid, they don't have to loop back through. If it is, they have to loop back through. But you could use a while loop. I think that would be a logical uh, way to do it. All right. And that's as much of a hint as I'm going to give you. This recording ends here, by the way.